I'm surrounded here by a material that you don't expect to come from ancient Egypt necessarily and being thousands of years old and that is of course wood. Egypt didn't have any forests. It did have a scattering of trees but most of the wood they had had to be imported um, because it was so arid there. However, it was this arid environment that has meant that so many examples have survived to us. Of course, when they've been underground in the sand for thousands of years, there's no bacteria, there's nothing there to um, break them down. And so they've survived in remarkable condition, as you can see. The first piece I thought I'd talk to you about is rather intriguing. What on earth is this? It is quite literally what it looks like. It is an enormous mallet. Now, this wasn't used for the refined work of objects you can see around me, but rather it was used to cut huge pieces of stone um, that would have been used perhaps then to turn into something more detailed and beautiful, but otherwise to build pyramids, architectural elements, temples and the like. Now, the form of these changed very little over the years, so it's hard to date them precisely. This is roughly second to first millennium. The way you can see this bell shape, it was actually originally completely rounded. And what I love about this piece is, is two elements that show its, um, its use over the years. One is this hollowed out cavity from repeated hammering against a bronze chisel. And of course, as one bit would get worn, they'd turn it round and keep going. And the other one is you can see there's almost a polish on the handle, which is from the, the sweaty grip of the craftsman, of the labourer, as he was repeatedly in the hot sun hammering over and over and over on this wood. Now, Egypt itself has no forests, of course, which meant that they had to import most of their wood. Um, they did have a few sycamore trees and the like, but most of it came from um, the east, places like Lebanon, which is full of cedar, a very hard-wearing but beautiful wood, which they could easily carve into making the kind of objects you see around me today. Now the largest piece we have here is carved from a single piece of wood, which again is rather remarkable for it to survive so well. This is a standing figure of a man from the Middle Kingdom, so roughly from 2000 BC. It's a particularly high quality and the, the naturalistic rendering of the figure is evident in the posture and in the, the clavicles on the chest, the subtle musculature. He's a very youthful figure. The hair has got very fine details in this what we call an echeloned wig, which is still stained a darker black colour. Now the face, it looks like it's been damaged and of course the surface is a little roughened, but it would have been carved in wood separately, as would the arms and the missing leg. And you can see the pegs where they would have, the arms would have attached and there's a hole where the leg would have been inserted. In its form like this, I find it much more alluring than the complete. One focuses in on the quality of the details that are there, the delicate striations of the kilt, the movement as he walks, the inlaid nipples, one of which is now missing, and the very the softness around the belly button. He's wearing a shendit kilt that is being held up by a thick belt. A piece like this would have been buried with an individual, but one of this size and quality would have been buried with a very wealthy and influential individual. It would have helped to represent the character or car, the spirit of the deceased in the afterlife. It held much importance to them, and so they invested a lot of time and energy in making sure they were buried with the best that they could find and the best that, that could be created with what scarce materials that were available. Over here, we have a wood and bronze head of the goddess Hathor. It dates to about 1000 to 700 BC. Now the face is very finely carved. The eyes and eyebrows are recessed for inlay, probably in a precious stone or perhaps a metal. And the shape of it is intriguing with this right angled cut. It indicates with the dowel hole here that it would have been attached to another object, most likely a processional barge, and it would have acted um, as a sort of aegis on the prow of this ship. On her head you can see a uraeus, the rearing cobra, and the crown has a circle of uraei. The cow horns associated with Hathor, who sometimes took on a bovine form, and then a sun disk here of Ra. 
Ra was her father and Nut her mother, so this is her, and of course the sun being deeply important to the Egyptians for all the life it gave the world. This is her paying homage to her father and reminding the Egyptians of her important link with him. Hathor was the goddess of motherhood, of joy, of dance, of love, of beauty, of all the best things really that one might associate with a woman. She was worshipped by men of course as well, and both in the private sphere and in the public. She was one of the most highly venerated deities of the Egyptian pantheon. Now, of course, the ancient Egyptians didn't just use this precious material for the small-scale sculpture and statuary you see here, but they used it for a wide variety of uses, for furniture, for temple offerings, um, as means of transport. It's actually amazing quite how many objects they made out of wood, considering how scarce it was locally. And it just goes to attest at how strong their trading links were with the rest of the Mediterranean. This year, Charles Eade has managed to put together a collection of wooden objects, some of which you see here, but many more you don't. So we'd love it if you came down to the gallery to see us and see what else there might be in store.